Hello class, this is Mr. Harp. In this podcast, I want to go over the next part of the forces unit, which is dealing with vertical forces. Now, last time in class, we did the force inquiry lab where we looked at all the different ways we can describe force and a lot of the different properties and just kind of introduced some of the phenomenon and things we see with forces. For the next couple of lessons, we're really going to get into how we describe forces mathematically and how we solve for what's going to happen to an object that has force applied to it. Okay, So we're going to start with vertical forces because it's a pretty simple case to think about, I think, and we'll find some very interesting properties when we just look at vertical forces. But to start out, let's go back to last lesson and talk specifically about weight. Okay, Now if you recall, we talked about how weight is just a force. right? It's a force that occurs because we have the pull of gravity on us. And so if we want to calculate it, we still use F equals ma, but we just replace a with g, which is the 9.8 meters per second squared, the regular gravitational acceleration. Okay, So there's a lot of ways you'll see people notate this. Um, I prefer to notate it as F sub g. Okay, So force of gravity. That's my preferred method to make sure we show this is still a force. Okay. Um, don't get them confused to think it's F times G or something like that. Okay, It just means F of G, meaning the force of gravity. Um, you'll see in the state core, they'll often describe it with W. In fact, on the um, sheet they use for the equations on the state test, they'll usually write W instead of F. I don't like that as much because it makes people think that W is not a force. It's, it means weight, but it gets confused to think it's not a force for some reason. So I don't prefer that notation, but if you see that, that's what it means. The weight equals mass times gravity. This is perf my preferred notation. The force of gravity is equal to the mass times gravitational acceleration. Okay, And again, this is just 9.8, which we saw from the motion unit. Okay, And so you can almost think of it like a conversion factor. If you're given something in kilograms and you need to know its weight in newtons, all you need to do is times it by 9.8 meters per second squared. If you do that, that will give you the object's weight in newtons. Okay? And so it's a very easy calculation to do, and it's a very convenient calculation to do because it helps us solve a lot of problems. Okay? So, for example, if we have an object that has a mass of 50 kilograms and we want to know its weight in newtons, all we got to do is take 50 kilograms times it by 9.8 meters per second squared, and that will give us, I think, 490. So 490 newtons. Okay? That's it. So this is 490 newtons of weight that the object has. Okay? Now, strangely enough, when we describe our weight in pounds, that is actually a weight. The English measurement of mass is called a slug. Okay? I don't know why they call it that, and there's a good reason why we never use it, but pounds is actually a weight as well. And so your mass is in kilograms. That's the only thing that doesn't depend on gravity that you're familiar with. So pounds is a weight, newtons is a weight, kilograms is a mass. Okay, so just make sure you understand that distinction. Okay, and again, if you need to get between one and the other, it's just 9.8. Okay, so let's look at a problem that we get a lot in force diagrams. Okay, we have an object that has a certain weight and it's being pushed with a certain force. And we want to know that object's acceleration. Okay, So let's just draw this scenario really quick. So we have a box, or some object, whatever it is, some object. 2,000 newtons of weight, right? which just means we have a force going down. Most likely, if it's sitting on a surface, it also has 2,000 newtons going up. And then it has this force being pushed to the right of 560 newtons. Okay? Now, as you saw in the F equals MA problems, this upward and downward force doesn't really matter because it's canceled out. So all we're worried about is this 560 newtons to the right, right? And so like we've done before, we say, well, F equals MA, and we can solve for A and write F over M equals A, okay? But notice we don't have the mass listed, okay? So this is a very common problem where they don't list the mass specifically, they just write the weight of the object. Okay, And so what we need to do is before we plug in the mass, we just got to divide this by 
to get the mass in kilograms. Okay, so if you do that, 2,000 divided by 9.8, you get 204.1 kilograms. And then you can plug it into this formula right here. In fact, I almost, I know this sounds bad, but I almost think of this equation first before I think of F equals MA, because it's so common to have to find the acceleration, and we almost use this version of the equation more often. But anyways, um, whether you start from here or you start from here, either way, we take the total force, the net force, 560 newtons, then we divide it by the 204.1 kilograms, and that gives us the actual acceleration. So 560 divided by 204.1, okay? And that gives us 2.74 meters per second squared. Okay? And there we go. That's the answer to our problem. So this object will accelerate at 2.74 meters per second squared. Okay? So very common scenario where you're given a weight rather than a mass, and then you got to plug it into F equals MA. Okay? And so that's just one common problem that you'll see. Okay? So here's the thing. There's, there's a lot of ways we can describe force problems for students, right? I could give you a weight, I can give you a mass, I can give you the net force, I can give you a set of force vectors, I can, you know, give you an acceleration, you need to find the force from the mass. There's a lot of different ways you can set up these problems, and it's hard for me to just iterate through and exhaust every possible option and tell you what it is, okay? I just can't do that. And so you have to learn to do a little bit of self-thinking when you're uh, trying to solve these problems, a little bit of critical thinking, okay? And so what I tell my students is they have to learn to become what I call master builders. Um, and I love the Lego movie, and so if you've ever seen the Lego movie, there's a scene where uh, this guy right here, his name is Vitruvius, and he tells Emmett that he must learn to become a master builder. And I love how he says it in the movie, and I want you to think about it this way, okay? He says that you must create the instructions in your mind. And that's going to be the way with a lot of these problems is I can give you a set of tools and I can give you all these little tricks and tips. But when it comes down to it, you're going to have to learn how to think through a problem yourself and come up with the solution yourself. Come up with the set of instructions you need to do to figure out that problem. Okay. So don't be afraid to try something. Okay. And have it fail. You know, you got to learn how to go through these problems. And again, you got to learn how to create the instructions in your mind. Okay. So one of the best ways to learn force diagram problems is just to go through bunches of examples to kind of get used to thinking of how you will come up with the solution, okay? So let's do this problem right here, for example, okay? So you have a balloon attached to a small rock that has a mass of 0.2 kilograms. The balloon exerts an upward force of 50 newtons. What is the acceleration of the balloon and the rock, okay? Problem you may have, you've never seen before. How do we think through it? How do we get through it? Well, again, I can't teach you that I can show you how to do this one, and hopefully you can learn, you know, tricks from that and tools. But um, again, it's going to be something you're going to have to learn. Okay. But let's let's do the best we can. So first of all, let, let's start like we would with any other problem and list what we know. We know the mass is 0.2 kilograms. We know that the upward force is 50 newtons. Okay. Now, that's not the only force that's acting on this object. We also have the weight of the rock, right? So we can calculate that. We can calculate the weight that this object has. Okay, let me do that in yellow. So the weight of any object, force of gravity, equals the mass of the object times g, which in this case is 0.2 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. Put that in your calculator. 0.2 times 9.8, you should get that that is equal to 1.96 newtons. Okay? So the downward force is 1.96 newtons. The upward force is 50 newtons. Okay? Now how do we find the acceleration? Well, we know, okay, thinking through, really the only strong equation in any of these problems is F equals MA. So we're probably going to need to use that. Okay? So let's write it this way. Force equals force over mass equals acceleration, okay? We know the mass, now we need to find the net force. Well, we can do that by taking the difference between these two, okay, which is about 48 newtons, 
and then the mass is 0.2. So if we want to find the acceleration, we take the force is 48 newtons over the, or sorry, over the mass, which is 0.2 kilograms. 48 divided by 0.2 gives us that the acceleration is 240 meters per second squared. Okay. Now this obviously isn't a great example problem. I don't think the balloon could give that much force, but if that was the case, that would be its acceleration. Okay. And there we go. So that is our answer to the problem, 240 meters per second squared. Now that was a lot of stuff, right? That was a lot of work we had to do. I ran out of space. Okay. Let's clarify. Let's look at this again and clarify what we did. Okay. So again, we had to come up with the instructions in our mind. We knew the mass. We found, based on the mass, we found the weight using the mass and the weight, or sorry, using the upward force and the weight, we found the net force. And then from the net force, we plugged it into F over M equals A and got our answer. Okay? So here's the thing. Not every problem is going to start like this, right? Find the mass, find the weight from that, find the net force from that, plug it into there. Okay? I mean, some of them will be very similar, but I can't just say this is how you do it for every problem. Okay, you got to learn to figure out the instruction set. You may need to find the net first first and then use that to find the weight, or you may not have the mass and you need to find the mass to plug into there. Okay, there's all these different setups. So again, you got to kind of learn how to think through these problems on your own. Okay. Let's try one more. Okay, so I recommend pausing on this one and going through it yourself to see if you can figure it out. So you got a team of bobsledders that push a bobsled to get going. If the bobsled has a falling force diagram, what is its acceleration? Okay. So we're given these values over here. We're trying to find acceleration. Okay. So let's do this. Okay. So hopefully you've done this on your own, but let's fall through and make sure we got it right. We know if we're going to find the acceleration, we need to have the mass, right? Because we're going to plug into m over a or F over M, right? So we need to find the mass. Well, the mass is simply the weight divided by 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? Which in this case is 3822 over 9.8, okay? Which should give us that the weight, or sorry, the mass is, mass is 390 kilograms, okay? Now, if we write F over M equals A, right, we know the mass is 390, now we need the net force. Now the net force is balanced in the upwards direction, and so we just need to take 400 newtons and minus 100 newtons, so the net force is 300 newtons. So all we got to do is take 300 newtons, divide it by the mass, which is 390 kilograms, and we should get that the acceleration is... 300 divided by 390, which is 0.77 meters per second squared. Okay? And there we go. Okay, so again, not a clear set of instructions that I can give you, but there's lots of tools like taking the weight to get the mass, finding the net forces from taking differences, things like that can help you solve these types of problems. Okay? And so your homework is a lot of problems like this where you're just going to have to think through, use the, kind of the tools and tips I just showed you here, and try and figure out the problems on your own. Okay, and again, we provide the answers so that you can hopefully make sure you're doing it right. Okay, let's talk about one more thing really quick before we end. Let's talk about weightlessness. Okay, because this is a common thing that we see a lot in physics or like to describe a lot in physics. And it's one of the things that makes roller coasters fun and you know going to Lagoon a fun activity and those types of rides. But let's think about what weightlessness really is. Okay. Now if you look at this picture, you'll see that everyone's weightless, right? They're just kind of floating around. But something's peculiar about this setup. Okay, if you notice, there's light in the windows. Right? When I show this picture to my students, they usually think it's in this like the International Space Station, but this is not on the International Space Station, this is in a plane this light outside, right? So how are they making this weightlessness 
if they're in a plane. Okay? And here's the key. Weightlessness on earth only occurs and really occurs because you're falling at the same rate as the object that you're referring to or your reference frame, right? If you remember thinking back to reference frames, if two objects are moving at the same speed along the highway, two cars, they look like they're not moving relative to each other. Well, if the plane's falling at 9.8 meters per second squared, and you're falling at 9.8 meters per second squared, then according to you, you're weightless because you're moving at the same rate as the plane is, right? And that's why kind of you get that weightless feeling on a roller coaster, right? When, you're, when the roller coaster's falling, at 9.8 meters per second squared and you're falling at 9.8 meters per second squared, you'll feel weightless because you're moving at the same rate as your as the object you're referring to, right? Or you're referencing. Okay? So let's think about how they do this on a plane. Okay? It's actually really cool. What they'll do is they'll they have these simulations they do with the astronauts that are getting ready to the, go on the space station. And they'll take the plane and they'll have it go through these arcs. Okay, it'll go up and down and up and down and just go in these parabolas. Okay, and what happens is as it, the plane is going at the top of the parabola, okay, it's constantly moving down. That feels like weightlessness because basically it goes into free fall at that point, okay, and so it's falling at 9.8 meters per second squared. You're falling at 9.8 meters per second squared, so you feel weightless, okay. And then when you get to the bottom, they go back up, right? They catch themselves basically and go back up into the parabola. Down here, you feel twice as heavy. Right, because now they're pushing you up at 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, in addition to the Earth's gravity, and so you feel weightless, and then twice your weight, and then weightless, and then twice your weight, and they just do that until they end the flight. Okay, so it's a pretty cool simulation that they do, and that's how they train the astronauts for the International Space Station. A really cool example of this is the MythBusters were trying to simulate the Moon's gravity for one of their shows where they were trying to determine if the Moon landing was fake or this type of thing, right? And we watched this video in class where they actually went on these, one of these planes and they adjusted the parabola so it would be about the moon's gravity or 1.6 meters per second squared, okay? And they did like the astronaut walks and tried to simulate their movements and things like that to see if their movements were accurate and would make sense on the moon's gravity. So it was really cool and they used this plane and I showed this video in class to show that you can have weightlessness occur by doing these types of things. So really fun, really cool. To see how this works. Okay. Um, I also show this clip in class from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which is actually a really good movie, but it has a terrible, terrible scene where the uh, USS Enterprise is falling into the Earth's atmosphere. And because it's falling into the Earth's atmosphere, everyone on the plane or the ship is falling and the ship's tilting and so things are colliding against the walls and all this terrible stuff is happening. But it's such a bad physics scene because in reality if they're falling in the Earth's atmosphere they should be weightless right because they're falling at 9.8 meters per second squared and the ship's falling at 9.8 meters per second squared so they just should all be floating but instead it's this really intense action scene where things are flying and people are flying and falling and it's just really funny to watch it's like this really shouldn't be happening they should just all be weightless alrighty so anyways that's it for this lesson again remember to make the instructions in your mind, right? Uh, I can't go through every single problem that you'll see on forced diagrams, but just make sure you know how to think through these types of things, okay? So the homework is 3.6, the vertical forces homework. Again, we provided the answers on the side so you can double check and make sure you're doing these right. But uh, let me know if you have any questions and thank you for watching.